the Land Matters MOOC. My name's Lindsay Stringer and I'm talking to you about Module 1, which looks at challenges in bringing land and soil degradation into policies, both the theory and the reality of it. I work at the University of Leeds in the UK in the Sustainability Research Institute. A lot of my research focuses on land degradation issues and I'm passionate about my research not just gathering dust on a shelf but actually getting it out there to the people that can use it, largely to the policy decision makers. What we're going to do in this module is address three different learning objectives. First, we'll identify why soil is important for multiple policy sectors. And we'll look at some of the incentives for bringing soil issues into national decision agendas. It's not always straightforward and there's always counter interests as well. So we'll examine some of those too. We want to improve awareness of the barriers and challenges in bringing soil degradation to the attention of policymakers. But it's not all doom and gloom. Towards the end, we'll examine how some of these challenges may be overcome. So starting off, it sounds like a really obvious question, but what are land and soil? Are they the same thing? Are they different? Well, let's start with land. Land is vital for sustaining life on Earth. It provides us with food, with water, with fibre, with energy, a whole range of different things. It's not just material things that land gives us, though. It helps us to manage hazards like floods, like droughts, and it supports processes of soil formation as well as nutrient cycling. The land also offers opportunities for social and cultural activities as well as supporting our psychological well-being. Increasingly, research is showing us that by being outside in nature, by being in forests, by being in open spaces, it can make us feel better. Now that's land, but soil is just one component of land. And soil is found in the planet's terrestrial areas, together with water, with vegetation and with animals. Overall, we like to think that land is there to support us forever, but actually it's facing a whole range of different pressures. Land really matters. If we look at it, a third of the Earth's land surface is degraded. And this is affecting more than 2.6 billion people all around the world. Land degradation, although it occurs in a single spot somewhere on the planet, it impacts upon the entire biosphere. If we think about it, processes like erosion or salinization and soil compaction, they reduce the soil's capacity to regulate water. The loss of biomass through vegetation clearance and soil erosion also produces greenhouse gases, and they can go up into the atmosphere and make processes of climate change worse as well. So as I said, land really matters. And this requires policymakers from a range of different sectors to be aware of the quality of land and soil, because if it's declining, they need to be able to take actions to deal with that. So how can policy and decision makers support growing human populations with the increasing number of mouths we have to feed and the multiple demands that we place on land without causing further degradation? And this is the challenge that's really at the crux of why policymakers should be interested in soils. When I talk about policymakers, I don't just mean policymakers at a national level, even though national level policymakers across sectors as wide ranging as agriculture, water, energy, and forestry, right across to health, education, infrastructure, transport and development all have a stake in land. But also the international political agenda is moving things forward. And we can see that land has really gained ground on the political agenda since the 1990s. In 1994, a global agreement called the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification was developed. This was pushed for by countries, particularly in Africa and particularly in the drylands parts of the world, where water is particularly scarce. These countries felt that land issues were being ignored and that it was really affecting their ability to be able to develop. The UNCCD now has hundreds of countries that have signed it, gaining wide support from all around the world. The next notable event that happened that really put land under the political spotlight came in 2005. At that point, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was published, and that looked at the state of the world's ecosystems, including the terrestrial areas and the drylands, and looked at what, was, what changes were taking place and what that meant 
for people's abilities to gain benefits from the land. Some stark findings were presented which really opened up the eyes of policymakers as they realised that biodiversity and ecosystem services were declining and that actually children of the future were much less likely to be able to gain the same kinds of benefits from ecosystems as current generations are getting. In 2006, the United Nations declared the year the International Year of Deserts and Desertification again helping to raise awareness and allowing countries to engage in their own activities that helps put land under the spotlight. Some countries issued commemorative stamps, other countries held film festivals or dance and cultural festivals to really raise awareness of both deserts and desertification and the kinds of degradation issues that, that dry lands are facing. Due to the success of the International Year of Deserts and Desertification, the UN then went on to declare from 2010 to 2020, there was a UN decade of deserts and desertification, keeping that momentum and that awareness raising going. Now, all of these activities, all of these events, helped to raise the profile of land issues globally. Fast forward up to 2015, and things had really taken off. So 2015 saw the publication of a report called The Value of Land. The Value of Land was developed by the Economics of Land Degradation Initiative and it drew attention to the need to act. It drew attention to the costs of land degradation and it showed policymakers what they were missing out on if they didn't act to address degradation now. So it considered both the costs of particular actions but also the costs of inaction. At the same time, 2015 was the International Year of Soils. So there are a lot of activities around the world that drew attention to the soil component of land. Finally, 2015 saw agreement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. These were agreed in September of 2015 and countries signed up to 17 goals that they think that if they address can move us towards a much more sustainable future. Land issues feature prominently in this as well. And finally, and most recently, in 2018, in March, in Colombia, the IP Bears Plenary, the intergovernmental platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, held a meeting to approve a report, a global assessment on land degradation, but also restoration. And this looks at the state of the world's land, as well as how it can be assessed and how it can be restored and improved for that land that is in a degraded state. So this flurry of activity that we see from around 2014 right up to 2018 shows how the political spotlight has really intensified on land issues. This is at the international level where the awareness raising is taking place, but all the activities actually take place at the national level so national policymakers are more aware of the importance of land as well. I mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals, and there's one in particular that is of interest to people who are interested in land issues. That's Goal 15, Life on Land. Goal 15 sets out to protect, restore and promote the sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, to sustainably manage forests, combat desertification and halt and reverse land degradation and halt biodiversity loss. Now each sustainable development goal has a number of targets with it that allows us to assess those targets to check that we're on track and making progress in the right direction. And target 15.3 is to by 2030 combat desertification, restore degraded land and soil, including land affected by desertification, drought and floods, and to strive to achieve a land degradation neutral world. So the word land comes up a lot of times within this showing that land issues really are on the global political agenda. Now this concept of a land degradation neutral world is something that's going to be covered in a future session within this MOOC. But just to explain briefly about what it is. The idea of land degradation neutrality accepts that land degradation in some parts of the world is going to continue. So the state of that land is going to continue to decline. But to balance this out, it realises that there are already degraded areas that can be brought back into production, that can be restored and rehabilitated. So this helps to level things out, resulting in zero net land degradation overall. So this provides countries with a route 
to committing to restoring particular areas of land to offset or to cancel out the degradation that is anticipated and that they know is going to happen. So the concept of land degradation neutrality, again, had a really big impact within the land policy community because for the first time it provided some kind of measure or target or aspiration for policymakers to be striving for. So although we've got this increased awareness at international level, there still remains a number of challenges in bringing land and soil issues into policy and decision making at the national level. These link to a combination of overlapping barriers, the specifics of which vary according to the different country context that you're considering. In general though, these kinds of barriers can be political and institutional, they can be capacity and resourcing barriers, they might be social or cultural barriers, or legal and regulatory barriers. What I'm going to do now is talk through a few examples of some of these different barriers. Ultimately, they're all interrelated and it's really hard to just put, one, put them in one of these different categories. But the categories can help you to think about the barriers in your own countries and how they might be overcome. Because at least if you know which category they fit in, it can help you to think about actions that target those categories specifically. So let's start first with some political and institutional barriers and some capacity and resourcing barriers. And these often come together because you need the political commitment to then get the resources to invest in the land and soil issue. So the first example focuses on a lack of knowledge on how to deal with new concepts like land degradation neutrality. The concept was developed through the SDGs. But then, now that it's agreed at international level, it's something that has to be applied, it's something that has to be, be measured and assessed at the national level. As I said, land degradation neutrality accepts that some land is going to continue to be degraded. But it notes that any current and anticipated degradation needs to be balanced by efforts to avoid, reduce and reverse degradation on a like-for-like -like basis. So what this means is you can't just go and degrade a forest and then restore some rangeland. If you're going to degrade a forest, to then get that balance, it's a forest area that needs to be restored. Now, the UNCCD has a science policy interface made up of a number of scientists and policymakers who sit together to work out the kinds of information that decision makers need. And the science policy interface has developed a conceptual framework for land degradation neutrality. And that can help decision makers to understand what land degradation neutrality is and what the kinds of actions are that can be taken. As I said, land degradation neutrality is covered in the next module in more detail. But I wanted to flag it up here because the capacity and resourcing barriers often link to the political and the institutional. Decision makers won't invest in achieving land degradation neutrality until they know what it is and how it can be achieved. The second example we'll tackle today relates to political will. Who's going to take responsibility? And if we look out there, the landscape is complex. There's a, a whole range of different interests and counter interests. Some people want land degradation to be on the decision agenda, other people don't. As we've mentioned already, land and soils cross-cut the remit and the responsibilities of multiple different ministries and departments. As a result, it's difficult for them to avoid conflicts and contradictions. One department or ministry has a policy to do something around forest use, for example, whereas another one might be dealing with, with um, the environment more generally. But sometimes decisions made in one sector or one department can undermine the efforts of those made in another. So it gets all very complicated. What it requires really is leadership but also strong interplay and coordination between all those different relevant groups to help balance the needs and the priorities of all the different stakeholders who are involved. Now, the media and the private sector and other stakeholders can often act as very useful allies, particularly in terms of raising awareness, providing information to the public about these kinds of issues, and in terms of spurring political action. But at the same time, these groups can also act as barriers barriers to the mainstreaming of land and soil issues into policy, particularly if that mainstreaming then challenges already established political and economic interests. So it's not clear cut, the need is there, 
but different stakeholders have a different interest in whether those land and soil issues are incorporated and mainstreamed into decision making or not. In terms of how this fits with the barriers we discussed earlier, this cross cuts the political and institutional barriers, also the capacity and resourcing barriers and the legal and regulatory ones. As a third example, we can think about knowledge, tools, data and information deficits. This relates to, to both capacity and resourcing again and social and cultural barriers. Now often there's a lot of information about the state of the world's soils that's out there, but it's getting it to the right people that really matters. Quite often there's a mismatch between the supply of information and the demand for it. Sometimes that the information isn't given at the right time or in the right format, and quite often we don't really know exactly what's out there. There's a lack of collaboration and sharing of knowledge and information across different government departments, but also between different countries. And it's made more complicated as well because the kinds of ecosystems that we're trying to manage often cross-cut national boundaries. So we end up having to bring lots of countries on board if you're going to adequately manage a particular ecosystem. The scale of knowledge and the scale of data that are available isn't always necessarily appropriate for the scale of information that the policymakers need in order to make their decisions. There's some social networking issues as well that often come up. There's often a reliance on personal contacts to channel knowledge and data on land and soils into policy. Networks are developed. You might know who the right people are within the other ministry that you need to talk to, but people change jobs, people move on, and those networks are broken or disrupted, and that can sometimes make it difficult. The other thing that we often find is that substantial training opportunities are provided for people within a single department, but they go on their training course, they learn about the knowledge and information and techniques and tools that are out there, then they come back, but they don't share it with their departments. So there's not always that mechanism in place for knowledge to kind of trickle down beyond that initial training course. As a final point, there's a lot of knowledge that we tend to undervalue. Local and indigenous knowledge held by people who've been managing our land and soils for decades, for centuries, is often neglected or undervalued within policy. Quite often we, we ignore this knowledge, even though people have developed successful solutions for example, to stop soil erosion or successful ways of harvesting water. So what we need to be doing is tapping into that knowledge, finding ways that it can be upscaled and outscaled, and policy can help in doing that because policy needs to provide solutions. And many of these solutions are already there staring us in the face. So it's just a case of working out how best we can harness those. So what do policymakers need to know? Well, to help address some of the knowledge, tools, data and information deficits, there's various simple steps that researchers and other stakeholders can take. The key thing really is to match the need for information, the demand for information, with the supply side. Research that's been done has shown that information needs to have four characteristics. It needs to be available. It needs to be out there. It needs to be visible. People need to know that it's out there. It needs to be accessible, so it needs to be in formats that people can understand, but also that policymakers can access. They don't necessarily have expensive subscriptions to scientific journals, so then that would be a barrier to accessibility. It also needs to be compatible with policy processes, so to provide information the day after a policy review is taking place isn't helpful. And it also needs to be compatible in terms of the types of language used. Compatibility in terms of language often doesn't involve starting from the negative. It involves starting from the positive. Build from the strengths. Tell policymakers what they're doing already that's working, but then go on to say how things could be improved further. Nobody likes criticism that just starts with the negatives and finishes with the negatives. They need positive ways forward to build on the work that they've already done. So overall, there are four things that you can do, and we've displayed these as a jigsaw puzzle. The first thing to do in order to get your research taken seriously by policymakers is to identify who the policymakers are, their, what their information needs are, and the knowledge gaps that they face. 
At the same time, build policymakers into processes of research design. They can help you to identify the questions that they need answers to, and then you can discuss with them what's feasible from your perspective as well. You need to seek policy opportunities. You're not going to have policymakers knocking on your door saying, hey, can you give me some information about soils? You need to go to them. By seeking policy opportunities, what I mean is ensuring that you're looking ahead, you're horizon scanning, you're looking for key events coming up where you can go and meet with policymakers. You know when a new budget's due, for example. You know when things are going to happen. You know when there's an election cycle. So tap into those opportunities to provide a more visible platform to your work. Finally, you need to be disseminating and communicating your research findings appropriately. Each sector, whether you're working in an NGO, whether you're working in academia, or whether you're based in the field, you all have your, your own individual ways of appropriately disseminating information. So think about how you can do that most effectively, but also how you can get the attention of policymakers in doing that. Policy briefs are one way that you can use to communicate research processes and outcomes which target those qualities of accessibility and visibility. Clarity and conciseness are vital when you're developing a policy brief. What you really need to do is present the evidence to support the recommendations that you're making and make them available in a familiar form to the policy audience. You need to present a process through which those recommendations that you're making can be enacted. So give the policymakers a to-do list, if you like. And you need to set out options and responsibilities. So what could be done, what needs to be done, and by whom and by when. What I'll be doing in a later session is setting out a guide, a how-to guide, how to develop policy briefs of your own, because that's one of the activities within this MOOC, is to guide you on developing policy briefs so that you can deal with your soil issues in your particular location and give them more visibility within policy decision-making. So to wrap up, what we've covered in this session has hopefully demonstrated that land and soil are really truly cross-cutting issues and they span a diverse range of sectors but also the interests of decision makers and policy makers across a range of scales from the international down to the local. Many different groups have an interest in land and soil but their interests aren't always mutually supportive. Political and institutional, capacity and resourcing, social and cultural and legal and regulatory barriers. These can reduce the chances of, of soil issues getting to policymakers. If policymakers then aren't aware of the issues, then they don't get into the policies themselves. There's also a lack of knowledge, tools, data and information. But it's not a completely lost cause. There are things that we can do as researchers, as NGOs, as field workers and as other groups. We can target the availability, the visibility, the accessibility and the compatibility of information reaching our policymakers. And in doing that, we can really make a difference in terms of what reaches policy and the kinds of solutions that are then put into action. In terms of tasks following on from this talk, what I'd like you to think about in between this and the next session is a few different things relating to the content of what I've said. Think about identifying the importance of land and soil across multiple policy sectors in your case context. Which sectors are most important? Which ones matter and why? What are the barriers and challenges in your context in terms of bringing soil degradation to the attention of policymakers? Talk to other people within this MOOC who are participating See if their answers are the same as yours or whether there's a big diversity in different contexts. Think also about, in your own case, what are the benefits of bringing soil issues onto the national agenda? What are the potential counter-interests? And how might you go about engaging with those counter-interests? And finally, in discussing your case with the other MOOC participants, is your case similar or different from theirs? Why is that? What's making it similar or different? There's a number of references and useful resources out there that can help you with your learning. I've put a few on the screen and I've tried to include a whole range of different media so that hopefully there's something that you can access and that spurs your interest and gives you some inspiration. Thank you for listening to this presentation.
This has been module one and thank you very much for joining the Landmasters MOOC.